Hey, everybody, we've got a great one today uh, for a change, for a change. Uh, Larry Brilliant, who is uh, an epidemiologist, uh, world famous epidemiologist, who um, has a very, very uh, interesting backstory. In the 70s, he was at an ashram. At a certain point, the guru there said to him, you should leave and eradicate smallpox. And, and he did. So that's interesting. He did that. Um, a couple pieces of business that I have. Uh, first of all, I hope you're subscribing uh, to the Al Franken podcast. Uh, when you do that, you get the podcast right away, right? As soon as we publish it, you don't have to go looking for it. So I hope you do that. I hope you subscribe. Another piece of business, New York Times ran an article this week, one in five, nearly one in five children in, in the United States doesn't have enough to eat. And we had uh, my guests a couple of weeks ago were Billy and Debbie Shore from No Kid Hungry. And I hope you can help them. You go to nokidhungry.org. Uh, they have been at this for 30 some years, making sure the kids get enough to eat. And uh, I hope you can help them out. And that was our podcast a couple of weeks ago. And if you subscribe, you'll see the whole list of our previous podcasts. Mm -hmm. Um, now I got something I, I, I got to bring up on my uh, podcast with Mark Elias, uh, this was last week, uh, I had a, a fake interview with Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling uh, was a major league pitcher for years and he has a radio show on Breitbart, which gives you some idea about his politics. So I did a fake interview with him, but a number of people thought that it was really Kurt Schilling. And one of those people was my college roommate. And I, I, I went to a college. I'm not going to say what it is, but you'd be mad at me if I said it. You'd say, well, f fuck you bragging about where you went to college. So I'm not going to do this. But this guy is smart. And then he went to Stanford Medical School. Very smart guy. He uh, texted me saying, I hate Kurt Schilling. I had to had to turn off the podcast. <laughs> so, and I got a few of those people uh, a little bit upset with that. Uh, so here, let, let me play a little bit of that. So it's an all white league? No, of course not. Look, this is going to be a fun league, okay? It's going to be entertainment, okay? And we will have an all black team. The Memphis Mud Hens, made up of black guys from double-A ball who just want a chance to play in the majors and get badly beaten by the all-white teams in the league. Any, any Hispanic players? No, and no Muslims either. Okay, um, I thought that was obvious that it was a um, kind of a, a, a spoof, what you would call a spoof. It was a satire. I had one person who really liked that, uh, and it was Kurt Schilling. He, he loved the interview. Um, this happened before. I did an ad for a commercial parody for Cigarette Aficionado, and some people thought they were actually sponsoring us. Uh, I had an uh, uh, actual sponsor, Cigarette Aficionado. Here, I'll play a little bit of that. Also this month, a photo feature of heavy smoker Ralph Nader. See Ralph wearing Versace, showing off his things, as he likes to call them, starting with his $80 million Hamptons mansion and his collection of classic dangerous cars. Okay, um, I think most of you know that uh, Ralph Nader uh, doesn't wear Versace and have a collection of dangerous cars. I'm going to do that. I used to be a comedian. I used to be a comedian. I think most of you know that I was a senator, U.S. senator, for eight and a half years. Uh, but I was a comedian for like 36 years. And so I like I liked jokes. I tweet them a lot uh, from my Twitter account, at Al Franken. And uh, people like them. Uh, for example, I did one... Uh, the other day, breaking, Biden pledges to read presidential daily brief daily. I've written a few from sheltering in, in place. Uh, learn something from sheltering in place. 
A watch pot never boils? Not true. Now, guess where I wrote that joke? At the stove. I was <laughs> waiting for the water to boil so I could make my soft boiled eggs. So that's my experience sheltering. Um, here's another one that uh, Trump weighed in again on, the, on dealing with the coronavirus. Suggests washing your hands with boiling water. Uh, Dr. Burke says he was just spitballing. So what I'm saying is there, there's going to be some humor every once in a while here on the Al Franken podcast. And uh, speaking of, of these tweets, uh, I asked folks to tweet questions for uh, Larry Brilliant, and uh, I asked him a number of those. So I thank you all for that. And um, enjoy, enjoy the interview. Larry Brilliant is with us, uh, and I'd have to be an idiot uh, to make this an uninteresting interview. Uh, wouldn't you say, Larry? Idiot is not the choice of words that I would use, but that's probably the only word you could use on the radio. You, you can say schmuck on radio. I, I, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let, let me explain why I say that. Uh, Larry is a renowned epidemiologist. He was part of the a team that successfully eradicated uh, smallpox uh, from the face of the earth. So there's that. Uh, Dr. Brilliant is the chairman of the board of Ending Pandemics. And, of course, uh, that's what we're going to be discussing here is, is the current pandemic. Larry also has an interesting personal history that among other things took him from Michigan where he studied medicine uh, to the Bay Area where he fell in with this crowd uh, <laughs> that included Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, the Grateful Dead, Timothy Leary. Anyway, we, we know what all that means, don't we? Brilliant and his wife, Elaine, joined uh, Wavy Gravy. I know Wavy a little bit, so I call him Wavy in, instead of Mr. Gravy. I think he's been called the countercultural clown prince. He's a clown. And uh, you and your wife went with him on the hog farm bus uh, that traveled across Europe to Bangladesh, India, uh, Kathmandu to give away food and medical supplies. And Elaine ended up at an ashram in India with this guru. I, is that what you call him, a guru? You do. Neem Karoli Baba. Yes. And uh, I'm going to let you take it from there, because this, to me, is an interesting story. And you can start wherever you want. You can start when you're taking acid, uh, when you're uh, a hedonist. Uh, you can, that's interesting, I think, to people. <laughs> and then, <laughs> or, or well, let, you let can me... start wherever you friggin' like. You left us in the Himalayas in a monastery. And uh, my teacher, who was a Hindu, had uh, many, many Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist students. So we would wind up, usually on, on Friday, we'd read the Quran. On Saturday, we'd read the Old Testament. On Sunday, we'd read the New Testament. Tuesday, we'd read the Bhagavad Gita. Thursday, we would read uh, the Dhammapada. And in between, we would just drink tea and sing songs and cavort. It was a very magical time. Um, when I first got there, I hated it. There were all these idols and foot touching. and Yeah, at first you thought he was a... Um, cult leader. I thought he was a cult leader. And, and, and a phony. Yep. I thought my wife had been captured by a cult. Okay, so, and when you stop thinking that, tell that story. I think that's a, a fascinating story. Well, my wife, uh, then Elaine not yet Girija, she had felt like she had found her place. And um, I had gone back to the United States. When I, when I got back to the United States, she started calling me and saying, I must come back to India, I must come back to India. And she ultimately persuaded me to do that. I hated being there. Um, and uh, Elaine, or soon to be Girija, was going to stay. And I decided I was going to leave. But before I left, since it meant splitting up with my wife, who I loved, we'd only been married a couple of years then, 
And I went out to a nearby mountain lake. I was trying to find anything that was beautiful to almost physically take it and shove it into my head because I was so dark. And I asked God for a sign that I should stay. And there was no sign. So I told Girija uh, we were going to go the next day and uh, I was going to leave. And she said, well, will you at least say goodbye to him? And I said, yeah, I'm you know, not rude. I'm just leaving. So we went down early. We sat in front of his tucket, this bench that he sat on. And the villagers had put apples and flowers on the bench to form the name of God, Ram in Sanskrit. And one of the apples had fallen off. And, you know, my Judeo Christian tradition, the name of God should never be incomplete. And it was now missing an apple. <laughs> so I reached down I put my hand on the apple to pick it up and the doors slammed open and Maharaji came up and jumped up and put his foot on my hand and I couldn't extract myself. I was stuck. That dick. While I was stuck on my knees with his foot on my hand, which I hated. And then he said, did you ask for a sign? And that gave me electrical craziness. And, and then he said, you're home now. It's okay. And, and there was something about that moment that made me realize, because I told nobody, I didn't even tell Elaine where I'd gone. So in the end, uh, I wound up staying there for the next couple of years, meditating and you know reading all the scriptures. Every time I would meditate, he would throw apples at me very often at my testicles um, in order dick. to remind me to wake up and not just meditate. That And then one day he called me. He, my, the name he had given me was Dr. America. And he bellowed out, Dr. America, Dr. America, come here. And he said, you have no money here. You have mo no money there. You are no doctor. And then he said in, in, in Hindi, tum to doctor nahin, you are no doctor. And he began chanting it over and over again. And then he said, in English, you are no doctor, U-N-O doctor, which means United Nations Organization in India. Uh, Dr. America will become a United Nations doctor. You will go to villages and give vaccinations. Smallpox, this terrible disease, will be eradicated. And you're supposed to go play a part in it. Go, leave, jow, get out of here. And, and then, um, cut to the chase, you did that. Yeah, I did that. Now, this is relevant to now because I know that you and Andy Slavitt, cut to now, and in addition to Scott Gottlieb, the former head of the uh, FDA under, under Trump, have put together a uh, plan for testing and tracing, mainly tracing. $50 billion to be part of the next stimulus package, I hope. Right. So that's what how smallpox was eradicated, is that you had lots and lots and lots of people going village to village, door to door, finding, and you found the last case of smallpox. The, the irony is that plan calls for almost 150,000 uh, contact tracers. We had exactly 150,000 in the Indian program. They're, they're very different. Smallpox is quite a bit different for your listeners. Yeah. It's easier in some ways. You can see the disease right on your face. It's easier because you had a vaccine. It's harder because it's India. It's harder because we didn't even have mimeograph machines, let alone you know iPhones. But the basic strategy is the same. You find every single case. And then you do epidemiology, you do backward tracing to find out where they've been and who they were in contact with. You do forward tracing to find who was in contact with them, might have caught the disease and have gone some other place. You find them and then you, you do what it is you have. We had a vaccine then, now we have quarantine. Uh, and it works. Uh, and it was plan A. It's what we should have done when the first cases came to the United States in January, which they did even though the only case that's been reported that early is February 5th, but that was a death, which means the case began in January. That's what we should have done. But the federal government failed us. We had no testing. They dismissed the, the threat, constantly saying it will disappear in April and all that other stuff. And CDC failed us, my beloved CDC, where every epidemiologist uh, goes to heaven at CDC. Um, that, that amazes me, but they did. And the World Health Organization had a test, and we wouldn't take it. And the CDC, which had always done its own test, screwed up. Yep. 
the conclusion is they screwed up because they didn't follow their own procedures. Yep, that's true. Wow. Wow. And that set us so far behind. Well, it, uh, it's not just, Albert, that they failed in that first test. It's that they then failed to do plan B, which would have been to bring in the tests the Germans did and the South Koreans used and China used. And, you know, there were other places for tests. If, if you're trying to get rid of a disease and you need to test everybody and you've geared up to make a test and it's contaminated and it doesn't work, you get a test from some other place. If you really believe that it's a serious enough problem, you kind of swallow your pride and you take what you can get. Later on, we swallowed our pride a lot to import ventilators and import masks. But at the one critical place, we didn't agree to bring in those tests. And let me just mention for your listeners, when you're dealing with a virus that uh, grows, increases, spreads exponentially, and the exponent is two or five, you don't want to give that virus a seven-week, six-week head start. Because if you give something that's growing exponentially a two-month head start, you can have a billion cases before you, you know it. I mean, it's really hundreds of millions. And we did that. And you can't have that time back. You can't historically revision it. You can't pretend that it didn't happen. But what we've done is we've gone from plan A, which would have been you find every case, you put a ring of quarantine around it, to plan Z, which is you close everything. And we've done that because of desperation. We had no choice. Once the virus was out of the bag and it was in every single county, every state, you can't go back. You then have to change your, your plan. The only plan available to the United States of America then was a plan that has totally knocked our economy and, and knocked people out of work. And there is a linear direct relationship between the uh, failures and the delays of those critical first two months and what we've had to endure in the past, what is it, six weeks? Obviously, the president has been criticized, and rightly, rightly, rightly so. We haven't had a coherent national plan. Usually that comes from a coherent president, which we don't have. But let's leave aside the president. We do not have a national plan today because we should have a three-year plan or a four-year plan. I'm going to skip the five-year plan because it seems too, you know, pinko. So we should have a three or a four or a six-year plan because if we don't, we're denying that it's going to be 12 months or so before we have a vaccine. And that, that vaccine our push to get the vaccine may, may force us to choose a vaccine which is less than optimal. It may be a vaccine that is injected rather than a drop. It may be a vaccine which has short immunity and you have to be vaccinated again every year. You'll get a longer, better vaccine later, which is always the case. But, but when we get that vaccine, you do not, upon the arrival of vaccine, you do not get rainbows and unicorns you get a vaccination program. And that program is going to have to be carried out in 220 countries. And how is that all going to be organized? And where's the vaccine going to be made? We do not have major vaccine production facilities in the United States. We have not exactly endeared ourselves to other countries who are going to say, oh yeah, let's give the U.S. its usual you know, lion's share. Uh, so there's going to be a negotiation I mean, you know, we're hearing reports, oh, they're trying to get this up as fast as possible. They're, everybody's working on it. I, I've asked people on, on Twitter to send questions. You've answered some of them already. Um, but one of them is, how fast can we get a vaccine? Because I've heard year, year and a half, and then, you know, they're talking about rolling this out as fast as possible, not even making sure whether testing whether it has terrible side effects or is dangerous. So some numbers to keep in mind. Uh, we had the polio vaccine for 70 years before we came close to eradicating polio. We had the smallpox vaccine for 200 years before we eradicated smallpox. It usually takes five to 10 years to make a vaccine for a novel disease. 
Uh, nonetheless, I am optimistic we will have it in, in, in 18 months um, because we are smartly doing things in a parallel instead of sequentially. It's like the, what we've learned from computers. Um, we are parallel processing. Normally, we would do uh, safety tests first, and you'd start off with 100 vaccines and 50 would be safe, and then you would do efficacy tests. And you start off with 50 and you wind up with five. Then you would do efficiency kind of tests and, and goodness of fit kind of tests. And you'd wind up with one or two. What we're doing is we're putting all of them through safety and effectiveness and a kind of efficiency check on them all at once and building the lines to produce them all at once. So we're doing in parallel what we used to do in series or in sequence. And that is what's going to give us a big leg up. Also, there's a couple of groups that are working with known vaccines that have been used before for MERS or SARS. I am optimistic we'll have a vaccine. I am optimistic that the vaccine will confer more immunity longer than the disease itself. Eventually, that does not stop the fact that you still need a three-year plan. Because once you get the vaccine, you got to get it into people's arms you got to visit almost every village, every house in the world or the places that people congregate. Um, there's 8 billion of us. What do we know if you've had it uh, and you, you have the antibodies about whether you can get it again or whether you can just go back into the workplace? You actually packed three questions into that question and you were right to do so. Each one is separate. A, do you have the antibody? B, does it confer immunity? And also for how long? And then C, are you still shedding virus that can infect someone even though you're immune? So three separate tests. Yes, this virus will definitely create antibodies. The six sister viruses, COVID and MERS, and the four coronaviruses that have been circulating for years and have gone to the coronavirus old folks home which is known as they cause colds. We also think of them as a cold corona. Uh, they, they all confer immunity between one and two years for the colds and two or three years for MERS and SARS. I don't see any reason that this, and more importantly, virologists don't see any reason for this virus to not confer immunity and create antibodies. But... So far, that second question about confirming immunity, that, that requires not just a test of antibodies, I don't want to be too geeky, but it, it requires a test of neutralizing antibodies to show that you are now immune. You can have antibodies and not be very immune or for very long. Um, we don't have that yet. All of the immune tests that have passed through the CDC, I think but one, have not been CDC approved. They have been CDC allowed by emergency use declarations or compassionate use. That means that instead of the FDA approving them, the FDA has accepted a certificate saying, yes, I've tested my own thing. So the, the, the market has been flooded by immunological tests that are not very good. Um, and it's, it, it's a wild west out there. You're saying you can have antibodies and still be contagious. Is that for a certain period of time? In other words, um, I would think that once you're infected with it, that uh, for a while you'd start developing antibodies and you're contagious, correct? We don't know the cadence of you get the virus, you rally your T-cells, the killer T-cells come in and the cavalry comes in the B-cells. And we don't know the cadence of the immunoglobulins and how many come in and, and when you create neutralizing antibody, and which is something from the B-cell. And we don't know how much you need to be really immune. And separately, we don't know if you can still set, shed viruses. There, there have been viruses throughout history that have different uh, proportions of immunity antibodies and shedding okay uh, so we, we don't need know. To know the answer to that we don't know we do not know no no okay. i certainly don't know maybe somebody knows i don't know and we can find out yes if you have a antiviral if you have a treatment if convalescent serum provides a treatment which i think it does 
and you can what, find what is that? Things. What is that? It means you've had the disease and um, you're cured and you go to the American Red Cross, you go to the blood bank, you give blood. They take your blood. Thank you very much. Please do that, If, by the way, anybody listening who has had the disease. And your blood is then spun down and the red blood cells are taken out and there's a, a yellowy gray part called plasma or serum that all throughout history has just been injected into other people to either protect them from getting or curing if they have it. Now, we're going to be much more refined. We're going to go through it and find out what are the immune globulins and either make that into a therapy or a, create actually a monoclonal antibody treatment. So I'm confident that we will find that kind of a therapy that will arrest the progress of the disease, will treat the disease, will abort, truncate, mitigate the time it takes you. But why that's important in the context of the testing and opening up the country is until you have a cure for the disease, it is ethically challenged to say, I'm going to get a bunch of volunteers and I'm going to give them all the vaccine or half the vaccine, and then I'm going to infect them with the disease and see who lives and who doesn't. That's not right. And this is called challenge testing. So until we have the cure or a cure or a treatment of any kind, it becomes morally problematic, in other words, wrong, to give somebody the disease not knowing if the vaccine is going to work. So you, you wind up in this, this kind of crazy moment where to test the vaccine and to test the presence of antibodies, neutralizing antibodies and viral shedding requires not just refinement of the testing, but also refinement of the treatment. Can you test this on young people who are in, in really good health and know what they're doing? Well, so you're, you're entering into a very precarious conversation. I am. I am, doctor. This is, this is the way we've tested so many things throughout history. We get college kids and we pay them. But, but the issue is that it doesn't, it doesn't not kill some college kids. It doesn't not put some young people on ventilators. It's a smaller percentage. So you still have the same black and white ethical issue. You know, if you saw the movie Contagion. Which you uh, you advised on, right? I did, yes. And so you, you see that we, we put a character in there who's a physician, and she vaccinates herself, or she inoculates herself with the, the vaccine and then exposes herself to the disease. That is something that doctors throughout history have done. And that's why these these doctors and nurses and first responders are really heroes. All kidding aside, I mean, you and I can joke for a long time, but these people are, they should be sanctified and celebrated. They, they are rushing into the fire like the firefighters did after 9-11 when everybody else was rushing out of the buildings. They're rushing in. They're willing to expose themselves and bear that risk. We need to understand that there are people like that still in the world and be very grateful for them and be grateful for the doctors who throughout, throughout history have, um, you know, drank a, a beaker of cholera to see if they could kill it or uh, drank a, a, a beaker of Haemophilus pylori to see if that causes uh, uh, ulcers or injected themselves with smallpox to see if it could be cured with cowpox, of all things. We're, we're at a moment that there will be some way to find some morally accepted way to do challenge testing. And I'm, I'm positive that that will be part of the um, repertoire of the, the vaccinologists who are working really, really hard. Well, you put some of your brain power uh, together with uh, Andy Slavitt and, uh, and Scott Gottlieb uh, on, on this uh, tracing regime that you want in the next package. Tell us about that, how that would work. Do you know anybody in Congress anymore? <laughs> we, we, I do. We, I do. We, and believe me, I, uh, I do. I am in contact with former colleagues and have been uh, talking about a number of things with them. And this is one of them. Please, please add this. Be because we didn't have testing um, the first two months of the outbreak, um, and we still don't in some places, what we failed to do was the 
plan A of every epidemiologist. You find the cases, you trace the contacts, and then whatever you then have, whether it's a vaccine or it's just quarantine or it's a treatment, whatever you then have, you apply it. That's kind of the general way in which epidemiologists have always worked. We fail to do that. And so people have abandoned that approach. But there is another way to do that. In, in many places of the country and in the world, there are now a trough. I don't think we've had a peak, but I think we've had a wave. But, but we are going to have a trough which means the number of cases are small enough that we can find every one of them and we can test the case and then we can contact trace and find all the people that have been exposed to that case and then we can quarantine them. But we can't do what China did. We cannot lock them up in a room and nail the door shut. We can't do that kind of forced imprisonment in a way. But if we pay people, this is the American way, if we pay them 50 bucks a day to quarantine and we pay hotels, which are pretty empty right now, to give them rooms and pay for the room and, and find them first, then you're putting together an alternative package, which is as good as we can do right now in America at this point in time. The plan calls for hiring nearly 100, I think it's 130, but nearly 150,000 human contact tracers to work with all the technologists to use the cool apps and the cloud-based systems um, that are also part of the contact tracing world. Salesforce has got one. I think there's 12 others that I've looked at. The Apple-Google partnership is part of that, but it's a smaller part than I think most people think, but it is a part. All those things are going to need human beings to first call out people who are sick, find out who they've talked to, trace them back. You, you may be looking for 50 or 100 contacts for some people and only four or five for others. Put them all into a, an online system, find all the contacts, go visit them, test them, and those who are positive, quarantining them, and even those who are just exposed, isolating them in some form. That system, we calculate, will cost a little under $50 billion, which is not very much compared to the $3 trillion of the stimulus packages. And it's, it's completely a stimulus package. The money goes to 150,000 people to hire them as contact tracers. It goes to people who are sick to uh, quarantine or isolate them. And these 130,000 jobs, they, they are, you can train those people up to do this job. This is not, yeah. A, yeah. you don't have to be uh, have gone to medical school, do this job. You, it's ba basically like being a census worker or something yep. like that, right? Yep. We, in India, we use people who are barely literate to do this job. And after training them, uh, they were doing it as good as doctors. Uh, it's a question of the training. So that's, uh, that's 130,000 jobs right there. And by the way, by the way, if you're talking about getting the economy going faster, and also doing saving lives at the same time, this is this will do both, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, Andy and Scott, who were really the architects of this, were not only a bipartisan uh, team and the whole group is bipartisan, but they were extraordinarily clever in putting this plan together. This This will help us get on our feet and do it in a way that's actually helpful in terms of how many people are going to get sick and how many people are going to die, right? Yep. And, and you can do it in a, another clever way, which is you can find the areas that are hyper-endemic, like New York, and you can start with the outer rings, find everybody, trace them, and keep moving in uh, so that you, you, you really kind of parrot or learn from the polio eradication program, the guinea worm eradication program, the smallpox eradication program. This is like a vaccination program without a vaccine. It, you know, it's a bad comparison in many ways, but it, it's something we can do with what we have right now. We don't have a vaccine, and there's a lot of clever epidemiological things we can do. Well, uh, I will call my former colleagues and text them, um, the ones I still talk to, and because uh, th this makes so much sense. I know that Andy Slavitt is certainly in touch with uh, many of them as well, and this is something that I hope my listeners will push for. Um, I had, uh, I went on Twitter and asked for questions. 
Uh, National Geographic had some great graphs showing what happened in 1918 during the Spanish flu pandemic when restrictions were removed too soon. Is our current situation analogous? Yes. The two cases of most importance are the difference between Philadelphia and St. Louis, where Philadelphia at that time was run by, uh, forgive me, Al, a political guy, not an administrator or or, or certainly not a scientist. Well, was he? Had he been a comedian before? Because that's the category. No, we, we don't. We do offended. not have a case control study using a comedian to manage a pandemic. Okay, well then I'm fine. The the political mayor of Philadelphia uh, wanted to have a I forgot if it was Memorial Day or or Fourth of July a parade, and did so spreading the disease. The uh, mayor in St. Louis canceled that same celebration, whatever it was, and St. Louis fared much, much better. That's part of the transmission cycle of the disease. But once the disease had passed its first round before a second round, which by the way, in the case of 1918 was much worse, maybe eight or 10 times worse, more than the first round. In that trough, the city fathers of my town, San Francisco, decided that they would have a celebration, an opening party. And on that day, everybody would take off their masks. They actually had masks then too. Uh, And this was November, December in San Francisco. And they would all go down to Union Square and celebrate. And of course, lots of people came to Union Square. It was the first mass gathering after the uh, 1918 flu had become so fulminant. And they went to Union Square and they all took, many of them took off their masks and hugged. And sure enough, that became the source, that event became the source of a second peak, a second wave in San Francisco that was devastating. And San Francisco, which like Singapore, had had a really good track record on the first wave, had a god awful track record in the second because they suffered from premature elation. Okay, well, let let that be a warning uh, to all the right-wing nuts that are listening to this. Okay, (laughs) Uh, what percentage of people have this? Of course, that's that's not knowable. I mean, that's not knowable. We know how many have tested positive or have had the disease. We don't know how many have had it uh, and have become serologically positive and were asymptomatic. But there's five or six studies in LA, in Boston, certainly in New York, one in Palo Alto and the area of the South Bay, um, and many others. They all seem to come to the two to four or five percent range, except for New York, where the I think the state was 17 percent and the city even more. That all sort of makes sense that the general rate would be low or mid single digits who have had it. Uh, and why that's important is that is nowhere near herd immunity. It's like the example in Sweden where they kept on saying Sweden's going to have its own path and they're going to get to herd immunity and they're going to get a certain number of cases and deaths and then they're going to be able to be economically productive. Well, Sweden now has more deaths than all the other Nordic countries put together, and its death rate is um, no better. It, I think it's worse than uh, Germany, and they got the disease at the same time. And I think Sweden's probably number two in the world for uh, per capita deaths, uh, only second to us. So it didn't accomplish what they wanted to, and that's heartbreaking because Sweden is the home of the Karolinska Institute which is where the Nobel Prize for Medicine is awarded from. Some of the smartest epidemiologists come from Sweden. Um, I think it was a mistake. It's the same thing that happened in the UK. The first plan was, hey, if we got to get to herd immunity, let's get there quickly. This disease is terrible. This disease is unique. We are fighting with a virus that does things that no virus that we have encountered does. And I'm pretty cautious about making that comparison. We call it a respiratory disease. And that makes you think immediately of influenza. 
this disease is nothing like influenza, other than it is spread, among other ways, respiratory way. If this is a respiratory disease, it's more like smallpox, which is spread by respiration, but affects every single cell in the body. I mean, this disease uh, affects people with illness that are literally nose to toes. You lose your sense of smell and you get COVID toes, which look like frostbite. But it also affects your kidneys, affects your liver, affects your heart in dangerous ways, affects your lungs in tragic and poignant ways. But it also affects at least two, we think, cranial nerves or the sensors of those nerves by causing a loss of taste and conjunctivitis in your eyes. Sometimes the loss of taste is, is really just the loss of smell and you can't smell it, you can't taste it. So we don't know what's going on. And it certainly creates microembolus and micro um, uh, clots all over the body. This is not a simple respiratory disease like influenza. And even the death rate is grossly underestimated. And the, and the comparison to 1918 now, in 1918, it was the middle of the World War. Your kids were being shot at. They had big bullet holes in their body and they had lots of sepsis and there were no antibiotics. If those kids who had influenza in 1918 were teleported to today, modern medicine would have reduced the death rate, I don't know, by orders of magnitude. Yet our death rate is much higher even now than not taking effect of the better medical care. And when we call our death rate the death rate, we are including in the denominator. So death rates are the numerators, the deaths, the denominator of the cases. We call it case fatality rate. It should really be fatality case rate. And we're putting, you know, in our mind, we're putting into that, we're saying, oh, well, the death rate is going to go down because of all the asymptomatic cases. Well, if you add the asymptomatic cases in this death rate, that's fine. Also added in 1918. And how are we going to do that? We have no idea how many asymptomatic cases there were because you only counted cases. <laughs> we had no tests in 1918. Let me ask one of these Twitter questions. Uh, this question is, I have heard many people, and this is in California and Minnesota, uh, say that they had symptoms similar to COVID-19 in January. Is this possible? If so, why didn't their close coworkers develop the same symptoms, I'm thinking maybe they did, when will it be possible for them to be tested for antibodies? Yeah, there was there was definitely a disease going around, as my mother used to say, in uh, in late December, January, early February, that caused bronchitis-like symptoms, people very short of breath, pressure on their chest, and a, uh, a hacking cough. My wife had that, as did many of our friends in California. We all thought the same thing that surely this must be COVID and that it was underreported. Those people, uh, at least three of them, have now had immunological tests and they were all negative and were very disappointed, of course, that they had not had it. They thought they'd already been through it once. I would say that, let's just do the math. The first known death was in on February 6th in California, in the South Bay. It probably took that poor woman three weeks to get the disease, get sick and die, that puts it back into the second week or the first week of January. So we did have disease in the United States in January. There's no question about that. Um, we did not know that she died of uh, COVID uh, because she wasn't tested. Why waste a test? They might have thought they were so scarce. We didn't have very many on someone who was so sick and had to be treated already. Um, and not until the autopsy was finally approved, which took a very long time. So it, as I say, beggars the imagination that we did not have cases in January, but the cases that I know about at least having been tested were not COVID. I say, I, I'm a little disappointed too. I had a, a terrible cough in, in January and uh, early January before we knew about all this. And that, <laughs> uh, but, and I, but, I, but I haven't sought out a test. I haven't because there aren't enough tests. So, so, so this brings us really to the fall when we are going to 
because that that disease that you had and my wife had or whatever those diseases were, uh, they were viral probably. Um, and what virus, I don't know, uh, whether it was a cold virus or a flu virus or something different. I mean, you know, I, there's, we have a lot of viruses that cause bronchitis. Just think about how difficult the problem is right now in making a diagnosis between something other than COVID and COVID in the flu season. And our flu season is going to begin in October, um, November, uh, and really kick up in December. And if we have a second wave coming then and have lots of COVID and lots of flu, then it's going to be really difficult for clinicians. Well, this is what the, the head of the CDC said, and uh, the president said he was misquoted. And, of course, he wasn't. I, um, I think some of the misquotes are some of the best quotes we've had in this run up. Now, okay, let's change subjects here. Really change. A little right turn. Grateful Dead. So you were there for the acid test, were you? No. No. No, no, no. I was not at the acid test. I, I did. Uh, I was from Michigan, <laughs> in Detroit. What year did you um, get to San Francisco? Okay, so I was a, when I was a medical student, I had a summer job as a civil rights specialist for something called the OEHO, Office of Equal Health Opportunity. And um, I was originally sh uh, sent to Mississippi and Ohio to check hospitals for discrimination. And then in a great gift from the good Lord, personally attending to my needs and wants, I was shipped to San Francisco for the final two months of the summer, of the summer of love. And that's how I first got to be a part of this culture. And and what year is that? I'm for sixty seven. Yeah, and 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 you're a big deadhead. I well, am. I, I mean, I I've, uh, I really love the Grateful Dead, and Bobby Ware is one of my dearest friends, and Jerry was a good friend. Um, I started uh, with other friends after we eradicated smallpox. Um, I started something called the uh, the Save a Foundation uh, to work on blindness, and we've given back sight to more than five million blind people all over the world, mostly for get a job. Well, but here's the thing. The Grateful Dead has done over 20, and its various incarnations, have done over 20 uh, benefit concerts where they didn't get any money and all the money went to yep. um, give back sight to blind people. It's one of the reasons I love them so much. They do that. They do that a lot. Yep. They don't make a big deal out of it either. Except to get people to the concert. Right. Which they don't even have to make a big deal out of. They just say, the Grateful Dead... And uh, people show up. So, uh, b a favorite era. Give me a favorite era, because I know people are tuning in, <laughs> or listening, listening. Uh, who? Because I'm, I'm going to use the deadhead thing to attract deadheads. So, uh, favorite era. Uh, you know, uh, my favorite show was uh, Bill Graham's last show as um, as Father Time, where Wavy was bundled up as. Uh, the new baby, I think it was 89. Mm -hmm. um, and Wavy, uh, and I, maybe Bill Walton played uh, the previous year. I can't remember exactly who played those two roles. But that was the last time that uh, Bill was there. For that one New Year's, it was very close to Chinese New Year's. So we also had the, the Chinese you know, dragon, which looked a little bit like a caterpillar <laughs> going through. So is and, this Winterland? Uh, no, this was um, either at the Coliseum, uh, then, which later became known as Oracle, or it was at um, the Berkeley um, Oakland uh, Auditorium. I can't recall which one it was at. Okay, I used to go to Winterland for New Year's a lot, and uh, many years, and I got a little story. It was New Year's, and I can't remember what year, and uh, I had to go to the bathroom, and there was like a half an inch of standing water in it hmm. and I saw a deadhead go in barefoot and I went I can't go in here <laughs> <laughs> so we were saying Franny and I were staying at a hotel like almost across the street and so I went well I know what I'll do I just go across the street go to my room and uh, so I do that and then I happen to turn on the TV and of course in San Francisco there's <laughs> <laughs> They're carrying the dead show. Right. And I look and I hear 10, 9, 
And then I, I think it was Graham came down riding on a huge joint on <laughs> this thing from the uh, from the balcony on this line from the balcony. And I'm watching this going like, oh, damn it. I wish I was there for this. <laughs> but it's a good story, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, there's nothing like a Grateful Dead show. There's, that's, that's, absolutely... that's the case. <laughs> Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you this. About BCG vaccine? No. That's, that's That'd be a substantive question for my <laughs> listeners. To... <laughs> this, this is Larry Brilliant. Okay. Uh, you're Jewish? I am. At, when you came into Ellis Island... Brillstein? My grandfather came to Ellis Island, and he came from Belarus. So did mine. And, and ah, this is good. Halfway between Minsk and Pinsk? <laughs> yeah, um, Belarus, uh, and my grandfather, Simon, uh, came from my, Belarus. My dad used to tell me that they came from a village called Melnitskov, and that it was halfway between Minsk and Pinsk. And... Um, <laughs> I think the name was originally Brillant, which in Russian, uh, it means diamond. Ah, really? And, and, and I think okay. that my ancestors that? were probably stonemasons working with stones that were very common and they wanted to exalt their role. <laughs> they said they were working with the most expensive stone, a diamond. I don't know how, I don't know how these things happen. Okay, well... Um... Larry Brilliant, you're very, 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 very smart, is what I like to say about Larry Brilliant. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week.